introduction. <laughs> <laughs> no. Good evening, everybody. As Hal said, this is our fourth panel for uh, a series of panels. We'll, uh, we'll continue until the 17th of December. There are three more to go. Um, I'm very delighted uh, to have three of our wonderful panelists today. Sir Rodney Sir is a triple A person, um, artist, archivist, and activist. Uh, he was very prominent in, uh, in uh, the East Village 1980s uh, scene, um, and he worked with Gracie Mansion for a long time, representing artists who were, back then we didn't know what was, uh, what was going on, but uh, people were getting sick, and, uh, but uh, they were living with HIV, and eventually uh, uh, died from the disease. Um, he has been very active uh, with uh, Visual AIDS and uh, the Frank Moore uh, Archive Project. And um, over the course of his uh, creative life as a writer and, uh, and uh, an artist, uh, he had to take breaks uh, for, for some of those, uh, uh, those three decades, having been in New York uh, since, uh, since he came from Montreal, to take care of friends who were living and eventually died from AIDS. Um, John Reed uh, had, is a recipient of a fellowship from his alma mater, uh, Columbia University, and he is a, an associate teaching professor at uh, the New School, and um, most of his writings have been translated into different languages, Latvian, Portuguese, Korean, Chinese, um, and other languages, and, and um, we'll talk some of, some of uh, the books that he's written over the, uh, over the years. And Hugh um, Ryan is uh, also a, a triple A person, um, and um, he is the founder of Pop, uh, a pop up museum of, of, uh, of queer uh, queer history, and uh, apparently George uh, Ch uh, Ch uh, Chancy uh, had said at some point that that you are a writer who makes queer history cool. <laughs> it was very sweet of him. <laughs> And recently, um, um, Hugh uh, Koch curated a show at, uh, at uh, the NYU uh, Fels Library uh, Gallery. Uh, of, uh, the, uh, the, the show was titled, An Eye, An, An Flinching Eye, The Symbols of David Winorovich. And it just ended um, two weeks ago, right? Right, but just, well, I think it's actually it's still, still up. You could still go <laughs> to see it, technically, but it's, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So welcome, everybody. My first question to all of you is, how did David uh, Wonorovich and Luis Frangella influence the work that you're doing right now creatively, artistically? Well, I can say for myself very easily, uh, having just worked on this Wonorovich show, <laughs> that's a major way in which Wonorovich continues to influence my work. I first came across his writing, that was my first point of entry to Warnerovich's work in um, to the mid-90s. And then slowly grew to know his visual work. Uh, at that time, I was uh, much more of an activist uh, in the streets. I uh, was working a lot with queer youth, uh, queer homeless youth in New York City. And so in that sense, David was an inspiration. Uh, and only later did I start to be more inspired by his writing and then eventually by through that, his symbology, the way that he sort of created a, a world through his work, uh, and that I think has always been an influence on me and my own personal work. Luis is someone who I learned about through David, and I'm actually really excited to be on this panel with people who know a lot more about him. I don't know as much of his work. Okay. Um, so, well, it's a, it's a pleasure to, and a surprise to talk about myself, and uh, I'm thinking about the new projects I have coming out. I recently finished a film project, which was shot in a kind of no-wave style, um, which was right out of that period, and um, right, just right out of that milieu. And then I have another project coming out in July, which is a Charlie Manson paper doll book, and I don't know if I have to explain the connection. <laughs> Yeah, well, when I, when I think of, of David and Luis, I think very much about that time where the East Village was very much a part of community. And it's very difficult, and in all my archiving practice, I tend to pull away from this idea of the artist being the sole person that's on an island and just pulls stuff up. I become much more interested in the milieu that they were in, the people that they were around, what they were reading, what they were eating, where they traveled and why, and who they traveled with. 
So I always see the artist as part of a community. And that's kind of really, really important. I mean, even when I think about David and Luis, Luis kind of has never given the kind of prominence that he deserves when I look at that whole social thing. Mm -hmm. Because he was like sort of like the guru mm -hmm. for like a whole bevy of Judy Glantzman and David. They were all, and, and, and Keiko Bonk, they were just all following around Luis because he had this very gentle manner, he was, had a very good eye, was very expressive with his work, and could just go and attack a surface. I mean, I, I think the bonding really bonded when they did the pier thing, where they were doing these huge murals. And I think that Luis was really, that's kind of where David really learned about scale. And all that was from Luis as an architect. But um, he was very supportive of the younger artist. And I think they all looked up to him in terms of, um, you know, just the kind of support that he gave them as being part of the thing. He saw things in the community, still parties in his loft, and he was very, just very friendly and um, liked the idea of thinking of people in the community. So I always think of artists as part of the community rather than as individuals. Okay. Um, John, do you see any um, thematic uh, similarities to, uh, to your writing, uh, uh, to that of David's? Um, when, when, I think about, when I think about David as a writer, he was coming out, his interests weren't exactly matched, synced up to his own time period. And he had to expand out and also include um, visual arts and really look at, and look at film, and look at all kinds of different things. And that freedom to just do other things well, came back to his writing and really radically altered it later in his, later in his, um, later in his creative life. So aspirationally, I would hope that dipping into other areas would be a real way for me to, to you know, reinvigorate, reinvigorate my, my approach to writing and my thinking in it. And I don't really feel comfortable I, there are things I can do as a writer, but I don't really feel comfortable just doing that, if you mm. know what I mean. That um, whatever you are as a creative person, your job to some large degree is to fail, is to try to do things you can't quite do. Um, so in that regard, I, I would say I'm, I'm hoping to borrow from the East Village in its context. Um, Hugh, at the panel discussion earlier this month at NYU's Fels Library uh, discussions, you talked about uh, discovering some of, uh, of David's poetry. Mm -hmm. And uh, how far along you you with that, and can you tell us more about what you're discovering? Yeah, that's actually been really exciting, because David's poetry is the part of his work that I know the least about, and I think is sort of least researched. He, especially in his later years, tended to remove it from his bio, right? Didn't talk about the publications that he'd made, didn't talk about the um, readings that he organized, uh, lost touch with the poets that he'd been really close with. And so I wanted to sort of look at just what it meant for us to consider him as a poet and then sort of see what was in the material, what was in the archives. And so I've been interviewing uh, poets that he wrote with, uh, people that he knew when he worked at the original Pottery Barn, uh, his one and only poetry teacher, Bill Zavatsky, who taught him at the um, Poetry Project at uh, Dowry. Uh, the Bowery Poetry Project, uh, Eileen Miles, who was in class with him. Uh, and it's been really interesting. I mean, the, the consensus uh, from pretty much everyone has been, oh, he wasn't a poet. You know, that, that was sort of the, the party line at the start was, oh, poetry is a place where he sort of dabbled, but it's not that much, you know, not, nothing important to look at here. You know, we can kind of all move on. Uh, but the more that I got into it, the more that I saw that there were parts to his poetry, uh, ideas and themes, obviously, that he brings out later, but also whole phrases that he has been using. I mean, often I think we think of his writing as being really raw, uh, because it is so evocative and it is so on the surface. The monologues and, uh, you know, everything in Close to the Knives. But if you look at his poetry, you can see that some of these phrases uh, become titles for his paintings ten years later. Uh, History Keeps Me Awake at Night starts off as a poem that he writes and rewrites in the late 70s under titles like Sometimes History Keeps Me Awake at Night, History Keeps Me Awake Some Nights, you know? And so he's really trying for a precision of line that I think comes from his experience as a poet 
uh, and from his reading in Rimbaud and Kerouac, uh, all these people who were trying to, uh, as you were saying, you know, do something they hadn't done before, to do something new, I think that he was really excited by this idea of moving outside of what he called the pre-invented world, of developing his own symbols, his own language, which is something that the poets that he returned to over and over again were doing themselves. Rimbaud was known for using really obscure French dialectic poetry uh, or inventing words himself. And I think that you can kind of see all of those things that come out later in his work through his poetry. And there are actually a couple good poems in there too. Like I shouldn't say that he's a terrible poet. Uh, there's one in particular called The Peach, which might be my favorite, which you can find in a very limited collection that was put out through the Bowery Poetry Project. I think it's called Life Without Parole. And it's everyone who he's in class with. Uh, so Island Miles is in there, and Bill Zvatsky's in there, and a whole bunch of other people. Uh, it has a couple of his poems, one of his poems in there. But that, that's, I think, my favorite of his. And uh, I've been actually talking to a poet named uh, Jameson Fitzpatrick, who is hoping to maybe, at some point, look through the poems and bring out a collected edition, because no one has ever done that with his work before. Mm. Great. Yeah, I was just going to say that, that my whole link with David Wanrovich, because when, when he came to the gallery, he didn't know what to do with me. Like, who was <laughs> in the gallery? So we sat down, we had a conversation. And our conversation started off about dreams and writing. Because I was also an aspiring poet. You know, I, I, I lived in a building with Ted Paragon, introduced me to Renee Ricard, and I published a chapbook of my poetry. But David kind of realized that I was someone he really wanted to know when we started talking about Jean Genet, and I said, mm -hmm. I have every one of his novels in first edition, including the original French, French versions, and ones that were published under other titles, like A Gutter in the Sky, that I think is like funeral rites, but published under a different thing. And that really fascinated him. So most of my stuff around David was around his writing. Mm. And he would type his, his, his a lot of his manuscripts that he would work over and over and over again on this thermographic paper, and he would come into the gallery and Xerox them and give me the thermographic copies oh, wow. that I have, but you know, with thermographic copies, they fade, so now they look like they're white, but if you hold them up to the light, you can sort of <laughs> <laughs> Okay. I'm trying to date his poetry through the different typewriters that he used. There's one in 78 that doesn't have a letter P. So he replaces it with B everywhere, you know, and like you can sort of, because he doesn't put dates on things. Yeah. So I should look for the ones that have the thermographic copies. Yeah. <laughs> um, both David and, uh, and Louise uh, are considered thinking artists. Um, they transcended uh, religiosity. Both of them were, uh, were uh, raised Catholic. Uh, they uh, they uh, touched on uh, sexuality and gender, um, environmental, uh, preservation, human, uh, human connections, um, conflict. How does that uh, transcend now in today's communication and uh, conversations that we have universally about all of those issues for you as, as artists who continue to do, uh, to do work? Um, well, one of the things I think about in terms of that, which is so different now, is that there's n the presumption that you're going to find some form of national distribution as an artist or a writer is always there. And there was, a, there was a moment downtown when you weren't thinking about that, when it was still a local community of artists, and it really hadn't been subsumed by um, the national presumptions of a of, of vast sea of, of capitalism. Um, and I just wish we could have that again, that, I don't know, it just, I, I know it's, it's a lost argument, that people have to have that now to, to make money, but I feel like part of the, of the challenge at the moment is to be free enough to not always be worrying about that distribution stream, and that that's part of why we're so kind of constipated in our, in our thinking. I'm not being afraid to fail. I think I talked about that before. Mm -hmm. I mean, in, mm -hmm. the, in the early days, we were doing stuff for a small group of friends, right? For our community. Mm -hmm. And we could make asses of ourselves and look kind of miserable. It was okay. We just we'd take what we learned from that and we'd maybe do better the next time. There's this whole self-consciousness about doing anything that's too bad. Everyone has their cell phones or videotaping it. It's to spread widely. So if something works out and you look like an idiot, it can scar you forever. We never even thought about that. 
you know, we, we didn't even think about the press writing about us. You know, we figured out the New York Times, ha ha ha, they're too like <laughs> straight. They'll never get us anyway, so who the fuck cares? Now, it's like the first thing that I always think about, I want to review in the Times. Yeah, you know, similarly, I think um, for me, one of the things that David's work really comes through is uh, his anger. When I, I, I teach a lot of writing classes, and I was just up at where I got my MFA teaching writing this summer. And one of the things I, I said to my students and really tried to impress on them was that in their work, the only kind of anger that was sort of acceptable or that they ever expressed was either anger directed at them or a kind of snarky, funny, not like slightly pulling a punch anger that was kind of a, an internet voice almost, I think of it as, this sort of like ubiquitous snark as anger. And I was like, it's okay to actually be angry about things if they are serious and to not stop being angry because it's not polite or to have to deliver it in a way that seems funny or palatable or even reasonable. Uh, and that I think that, well, we live in a time right now of, of great anger and fear in many ways, uh, particularly for younger students and younger writers who are progressive in whatever sense or left in any sense, there is, uh, I find sometimes a fear of expressing their own anger, that it will either be too much or, uh, like you said, will get them embarrassed that someone will tape it or they will say the wrong thing and they will become that person on the internet. Uh, and I often say, well, then take it off the internet, you know, express your anger in person or, you know, go to a reading. Um, but I, I think losing that anger as a, as a force to make art from and to, um, make activism from is, is not a good thing. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a tendency uh, in, uh, in our society, uh, even in the arts culture, uh, to uh, see David's work and uh, Louis's work in two ca uh, glib categories, art, gay artists and uh, the HIV uh, AIDS epidemic uh, activism. What are your thoughts about that? Because it's co continuing today. Most gay artists so, uh, who declare themselves as gay artists, that, that's the pigeonhole that they're, uh, they're put into. Yeah, that's why, that's why Andrea Rosen will not connect Phyllis Gonzalez Torres anything having to do with AIDS. <coughs> Just for that very reason. And I'm, to me, it's like, you know, that's not going to stop. I mean, you, you can have both and. It doesn't have to be either or. But there is a lot of, like, pigeonholing in one, because that's what people like things in nice, neat, little things so that they can digest them easily. Um, I think mixing them up is much more interesting, you know, laying them out. Um, but I don't know how to uh, sort of change that. I think somehow with, you know, my interest of seeing the artist is not like inside of this total gay community that's only part of a larger thing maybe does that because they can see the person in the world that connects to other things outside of like their queerness. Okay, John? One thing that um, I keep, one thing that frustrates me when I read about this period um, is that the, the, long, the long timeline is a little mangled. Um, there's a compression of the later 80s and the early 80s and the attitudes um, and, and very strong, angry political attitudes that really didn't appear until like, let's say 83 or 84, I would guess. It mm -hmm. could be, I think that's about right. Um, and there's a conflation of these ideas to diminish any collective experience or collective um, pursuit that happened before that. Um, and I find it very, very commonplace. It's, it's also interesting that that same compression of the timeline is used by extreme right-wing people to rewrite the period. When they're, when they're talking about how Reagan, um, it makes me so sick, I can barely talk about it. But when they talk about how Reagan was a hero, right, um, they compress that timeline. So I, I would like to see just a more accurate timeline played out when people talk about the period. That's, that would be my one, my one, my one admonition <laughs> when, when thinking about that moment. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that 
uh, has been coming up a lot for me with all of these exhibitions around Warnerovich uh, has been that it's not only a collapse of him into a, a gay artist or an AIDS artist, but there's also this collapse that anything about AIDS is actually about act up, as though there is no other voice beyond that. I read one review of the, a major review of the Whitney show that faulted it for not showing what a leader in act up David Warnerovich was. And I was like, but he wasn't. And so this whole <laughs> review is crap. Uh, and, and that has been really frustrating to me, is the, the levels of reduction. It's like we can't reduce far enough, you know? It's like the box gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, uh, Sir Rodney, uh, you've, uh, you're now uh, curating shows or, uh, or uh, supporting artists who are living with HIV. Uh, some uh, some uh, have died uh, from the disease. How do you sustain the passion and how do you continue the advocacy work that you do? over 30 years now? Well, actually, you see, I, I, I work a lot with visual aids and their archive thing and mining and feeding information into that. I also work with a lot of artists that have nothing to do with aids. Like I manage the Reno Grady studio and I'm working with my uh, partner's archives now. Um, but I think it's the community that they were involved in because it connects to so many people every time someone dies from looking at their artwork because i think of it in terms of the community i i guess i get a lot of my stuff and passion for it in my bringing other people that were kind of part of that artist community into it that's how i get the most rich information, I can get under the feelings of the information going through the material together. And the material is usually interesting in itself, but it's much more interesting if you're working with it with a number of people that knew the artist and are coming at it from different places at different points in his life. It just, it, it, it just illuminates what you're seeing so much more. So I always try to keep my work inside of the community and not just focused on the archive that I'm working in, but how that archive feeds how material that I'm finding there feeds into other people and other things, and I sort of like bring that expansion in to make it rich. So I guess that's how I do it. If I were just to sit there alone and imagine the artist being in an island going through his stuff, I'd probably get really depressed. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the show that, that we have in, uh, in front of us all around us right now is, uh, is primarily um, thought about as uh, the collaboration uh, effort between David and Louise. Uh, most of the art uh, that's around us right now were, uh, were done by both uh, artists in Buenos Aires um, and all around uh, the country of uh, Argentina. Do you see any uh, artists, writers right now who are doing collaborative work that are out there that speaks of thematic uh, issues that are relevant in today's society? From uh, the students that you're mentoring, the, uh, the students that you see at NYU, at the New School, or even the visual aids, be, um, artists collaborating with each other. Hmm. Hmm. I mean, the artists more and more are wanting to get their own, they're a little bit more selfish. They want to get their own attention for themselves. There's more and more and more of that, more and more isolation. I mean, they want to have friends, but they're not so interested in sharing until they get their piece of the pie first. We never thought of it like that. We always thought of it as like a group. Oh, if someone gets something, we're sharing it with everybody else. That doesn't happen as much. In terms of what's out there, in terms of people working and collaborating together, I would say they're, they're, um, because I sort of tell people, I sort of dropped out of the art world in 1994. Because that's when I started spending more time in Europe and not paying attention to galleries and what's happening with the younger artists, right? So I kind of lost a lot of that track, but I'm seeing that now there's a lot more work done with installation sorts of stuff, and particularly performance. Mm -hmm. And the whole <coughs> performance thing really relies on you working more collaboratively with people and intermedia and that sort of thing. So they want the performance, and they want the films, and they want the this, and they want the lighting, and they want the costumes. So there's more of that kind of thing happening. I think that's where more of the collaboration comes in, and I tell people, well, there's more performance now because you don't need to worry about renting a studio and. Uh, <laughs> and the materials, it's like a much cheaper, I mean, you know, you can get elaborate with the media that you use and elaborate with the costumes, but it's still much easier. Right. And I'm thinking about your 2008 um, performance piece, um, Free Advice, 
when you uh, you set up uh, you set up a counseling business in in a in a two lane uh, rural ro uh, road, yeah, pe people Hamptons. just came to you and they sat down and you you talked to them and that was the performance. And uh, I don't see those kinds of uh, situations anymore, mm -hmm. especially in writing. I don't know uh, about uh, about some of your students if they're yeah. collaborating with each other. Or... I've been trying to organize my thoughts around it. I think that um, I think that people want to do it. The problem is, of course that there's not a good way to distribute it. Um, that distribution is tightly wound with the, the idea that the artist has a heroic stature, which feeds into advertising, which is how you sell ads, which is what you fill your review section, you fill your review section with content that brings ads. Um, it's, all, it's all bundled. And unfortunately, despite its ever glow and temptation, it's, it's just a very hard way to get work out there. Um. Yeah. I would say that um, one group of sort of interesting sets of collaborators that I've been seeing, it's been really exciting to me, are among trans photographers who are working right now. You know, Zachary mm -hmm. Drucker's uh, book Relationship with Reese Ernst, who she was in a relationship with, I think is a really good example, but also her work with Amos Mack and her work with Flawless Sabrina, um, you know, but not beyond her, I think you see Laverne Cox lending her talent to, you know, a documentary by a trans filmmaker about Cece McDonald, and I think because in some ways, although there is this trans media moment that's sort of happening right now, supposedly, they are still often outside of these methods of distribution and unlikely in many cases to get these New York Times reviews. Um, I think maybe that sort of uh, has kept the community kind of working together a little bit more. There's a need for support in that way. And so those are some of the most interesting collaborations I've been seeing happening. Um, also, since you mentioned visual aids and you're talking about writing, I love their duet series oh, of yeah. the books of you know one or two people discussing an artist. I think those are really fantastic. Uh, they're not exactly collaborations in that sense, but they are collaborative creations. In the, uh, the, the articles that you write on uh, them story mm -hmm. uh, for a continuous uh, publication, have you seen, uh, seen any collaborative artists or writers in, in that venue? Mine, I, the stuff I write for them is all really historically based, so I think the most uh, recent article concerned someone who died in the 80s. So <laughs> while there are some collaborations that I'm referencing, they're from you know World War II. It's uh, Claude Cahoon working with, um, what was her partner's name? I can't remember right, I'm Ma Marianne. Anyway, they're, they're all historical, unfortunately, so not recent ones. John, you wrote a book, uh, a play uh, of, uh, of um, Shakespeare. And how, how did, uh, was there any kind of influence at all of David's writing from, uh, from the tragedies that, uh, that, you, in, uh, that you wrote about in that play? Well, that's interesting to think about um, that context. It may have, you know, I started that project when I was about 21. So I was still very much coming out of um, an environment where um, that community was fresh to me. Um, having known those people when I was, you know, from 10 to 20, let's say. Um, so it's possible. I'm, I mean, the, the big, I would say the Wooster Group was the big influence on that project. Um, mm. But certainly that's a near miss, right? So the project was I took apart the known works of Shakespeare and put them back uh, line by line as a new tragedy. So it was a, a disassembling of all of Shakespeare and reassembling it into, into a new context. Into ideally the kind of anti-war play that Shakespeare would have written had he not been funded by the um, Queen. <laughs> Uh, this is the, the, the uh, question uh, for me, and, uh, because that's the work that I do uh, as the executive director of the HIV Arts Network. Um, are people oblivious of the HIV crisis today? Did you mm -hmm. say that again? Are people oblivious of the HIV crisis today? Which the people, which crisis? Well, <laughs> the, the, the media only captures um, World AIDS Day, which is December 1st, right. in this country right now. Mm -hmm. Other than that, it, uh, unless uh, you, you went to the Whitney or you're here in this uh, gallery and you're connected to our world, you, uh, you might know or are more knowledgeable and attentive uh, to HIV AIDS. Mm -hmm. But outside of this community, what, what's going on there? 
especially the, uh, the uh, split second generation that we have. Yeah, people don't get it. There's still this big stigma where people do not want to talk about their status. It's a very kind of private thing. I sort of understand that. But the big, big issue that a lot of uh, looking at this HIV thing today is the HIV criminalization. And people aren't really aware of how that works, of how you can, as an HIV positive person, be thrown in jail for having sex with someone because you're still seen as like a deadly weapon. And I think in a way that keeps people from being tested because they never have to be in that sort of situation, the ones that sort of know about it and then the ones that don't. And I think there's less kind of fear about this HIV thing because they figure, oh, we have medications now, so if I get sick, I can just take pills. They really don't understand what goes on with your body and your health over time and adjusting to medications and the medica certain medications don't work for everybody. Um, you know, so I, I, I think it's, it, it's the, you know, part of the stigma and the fear of not being out, so you don't really hear any conversation about it. And if I'm at a dinner party and I bring up anything to do with AIDS, it stops the party still. That hasn't changed. But the criminalization thing and uh, is really something kind of devastating that's affecting a lot of communities, particularly women, because they get kind mm -hmm. of worse. You know, it's used as a, as a thing of control. Any thoughts? I mean, I think one thing that I've been finding sort of really useful and, and provocative is I, I do think that the, the context of the conversation, that the, the conversations that do exist around HIV and AIDS have changed in a certain really drastic and important way, which is I think the mainstream conversation, and this is not the totality of the conversation around the world or in the U.S., but the mainstream of the conversation has moved to a position of AIDS is bad. You know, we feel bad for people who have AIDS, which is a far cry from the context, right, in which David was working. Uh, and I think there's a sort of like, um, there is an unfortunate thing that happens with that, which is that at, at least in a time period when David was working, there was an understanding that AIDS was a disease that was affecting people who were marginalized by society. And I think that now we have this sort of surface level oh, we you know, feel bad, pity the person with AIDS, which in some degree is hiding the fact that the people who are most likely to get AIDS today are still those who are poor, uh, who are you know, outside of some of the circles of normativity, particularly like, say, was it gay black men are, have a one in two chance of contracting HIV in their lifetimes, according to the CDC. Uh, and so I think in some ways the conversation has shifted, but in another sense, we're still not talking about the people who are most vulnerable, who, you know, whether that's in the US or globally, I don't think that has shifted, uh, and I think that there is a degree to which almost the, the conversations that we do have now, which are about PrEP, uh, which is you know, mainly about protecting people who are negative, uh, right? So there's a way in which the conversation feels like it has shifted, but it also hasn't. It is still censoring, centering those who sort of have the most power, who have the most privilege already, um, and the conversations that we're not having remain the same. And I'm really thankful to the work of Ted Kerr, who is doing a lot about um, the origins of HIV and looking at the, the cases before HIV existed, right? So I think he draws the timeline all the way back to the late 60s. Yeah, with Robert Rayford. Robert Rayford. And one of the things that he says a lot, which comes from ethicist uh, Tracy West, is that our, or our morals for a story start at the origin point, right? And so what we think is the moral response to something comes from where we think that story began. And if the story begins with white gay men in urban situations, those are the people who we think we need to be serving to sort of deal with the story of HIV. If we draw the story back further to deal with uh, poor people of color who perhaps do not have health care in this system, then we have a very different ethics and a very different conversation we can be having around it. So my hope is that we're getting towards a point of having more of that conversation, but I, I think you're right, it's still mostly not a conversation that's happening at all, and when it does it's happen, not the important happening at all. And I think there's a lot of guilt, particularly for people from my generation that lived through the AIDS thing, because I was on a panel, I think I talked about this and wrote about it, I don't know if it's ever public, I can't remember, but I was on, I was on a panel with, uh, who was there, Colin McCormick, Walter Rollins, and Marilyn Lynch at Gracie Mansion, mm -hmm. and I said, I will not be on a panel as the only person of color and the only queer person on the panel. You have to bring in another person of color, and we brought in uh, Yasmin Ramirez, right? 
And we sat there and they went through the whole glory, wonderful days of, of, of the East Village and they showed all these slides of all these people and it went on for 45 minutes. And then I had to say something. I said, we've been looking at all these people for 45 minutes and over and over and over again and no one has mentioned the word AIDS or that the majority of the people you see in these slides are dead. <laughs> it was the silence and a bunch of people stood up and like applauded because it was really true. I mean, I think there's this silence around that period for a lot of people because they behaved very badly. Mm -hmm. They didn't know, they were scared, they were phobic. They really reacted very badly and to think about that time me, it's, it's too sad for them and implicates them too much in how they behave. But they didn't know any better then. They know more now. Well, I don't know if you know they know now. A lot of them are still as ignorant as they were then. Um, and that's part of the silence too. Because you have to turn around to them and say, Oh, well, this was happening in these films. Well, what were you doing? Well, all these friends around you that were dying, and where were you? You know, I mean, I was going around from friend to friend, I had like no fear. I remember sitting with a friend and eating, eating some food and I reached over to their plate because they weren't that hungry and started eating their food. And they were like, it's like you're touching my food. And I'm saying, yeah, it's fine. I can sort of eat your food. That kind of meant so much to them because they were so withdrawn in a pariah that no one wants me to And psychologically carrying this weight and that little gesture kind of meant like the world to them, that I could even think of doing that. You, you, you become much more sensitive to the little things that matter and so many other things drop out of the wayside and every day becomes precious and just being able to walk up the street and look up at the sky and see that there are blue skies has so much meaning, mm -hmm. um, you know, that we take for granted every day. So I've learned a lot through this. I mean, it's enriched me in, in ways that I would not have expected. And I guess it still does. It's one of the things that it brings to me the most and why I'm so attracted to it, in a way. I don't have issues around death. You know, I work with, with, with death, uh, end of life doulas, and I'm part of Ted's group, the what does an HIV doula do? So we spend a lot of time dueling the system not so much the people, but the system around it to make a system more compassionate mm -hmm. to people that it serves. Absolutely, absolutely. Any final thoughts before I open it up to, uh, to the audience? Uh, Maybe I'll follow up on that too, if that's okay. I, I, I worry about this whitewashing of history that is happening with that period. Um, every, every, major, every major venue that's published a piece of mind on the subject um, and on David, I guess I wrote pieces in Gawker, Out, and Slate. And they've always taken out the really tough stuff. They always, they take it out of all my pieces, but they took, take it out of those. Um, and you can see what it is. Um, you know, I've got, I really, really hate Reagan. I really hate Mayor Koch. I hate all those people around. I hate them. I hate them as much as I hate Henry Kissinger. I really, really hate them. And, um, we're allowing that to just go away. So, I, I, I don't know. I mean, that's the one thing that really, really bothers me. And even since I researched it, um, even since I lasted research, when I published the Slate piece in August, um, I feel like there's a new effort to whitewash this period. Mm -hmm. um, and I just, I just, it's unfathomable to me you know, that they could get away with that. And that's... What, yeah. What's to be gained by white one? Uh, there's, a, there's a new timeline that um, basically has Ronald Reagan working behind the scenes to, um, mm -hmm. to um, sway the country um, in AIDS and HIV research. Um, Nobody, I mean, nobody talks about Koch at all anymore. Um, I mean, it's endless. The list of those guys is endless. Didn't they right. name a bridge for him? What's that? Didn't they name a bridge for Koch? I can't hear you. Did they name a bridge for Koch? Did they name a bridge for Koch? Yeah, about two years ago. Oh, wow. Yeah. Koch is, 
It's, it's funny because Koch and his Vichy re regime are, are the most, of all of them, are the most sickening to me. Because he was right here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He was right here. He knew what was happening. He could have said, no, we're not going to go along with you guys. Well, how long was that? Three years that he did that? Three years? Yeah, the, I don't know if anyone saw the New York Historical Society a few years ago had a show called uh, The First Five Years about mm -hmm. the history of AIDS in New York. And it was the worst most um, gauzy view of AIDS in New York, it recouped everyone. Cardinal O'Connor was trying his best, you know, and, and it was this horrifying, it was just this twisted version that's whole point was to make New York City as a whole, everyone, the institution, the people, the churches, the everyone, look good in the AIDS crisis. Like the whole thing was this, sort of like you were saying, this refusal to say, what did I do? during that time period. It was a whole exhibit built around that idea and it was just ghastly to look at. I was, I was like furious. By the time I left, I was like screaming at the exhibition. Uh, and, and yet this is a major, I mean, it's the New York Historical Society, right? Mm -hmm. If they're not going to put on a sort of true exhibition about the place of New York during the crisis, then uh, how is anyone going to know any better? Mm -hmm. I would love it if someone would call out what David called uh, Cardinal O'Connor. Does anyone remember? Oh, the, um, something like Nazi pedophiles. Yes. There's a lot of blood no, no, sucking. No, he used a thing for the uh, to describe. I remember. I remember. He was a fat fucking cannibal. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There you go. Questions from our audience. So we're wonderful with three panelists here. Yes. Yeah, you say, the New York Historical Society is, I mean, like way to the right of Donald Trump. I mean, the people on their board and the shows they've had about Vietnam or civil rights or anything are just, I mean, they're just super right wing brainwashing on any issue and, and they just worship Henry Kissinger. And I've gotten into some incredible arguments, embarrassing the director at different events. And, Good for you. It's just <laughs> terrible. And Donald's question about AIDS, um, I know a lot of people think it went away, but um, in a lot of African American newspapers, they're always talking about how it's being hidden. I mean, there's a huge, gigantic crisis with AIDS and AIDS orphans in Africa. It's a major <coughs> world problem. And it's not going to get publicity in the United States because the ruling class doesn't want anybody spending charity money over there. You know what I mean? The last several presidents have cut back on aid and UN commitments over there. It's just, it's really, really bad news. Any other questions, thoughts? Yes? I just have a comment. I have been making art in New York for 25 years, and I've always gravitated towards community, you know, working within communities. And uh, I think it's also a sense choices that we make, whether we follow the art industry or not. And I surround myself with a lot of artists that work collaboratively, and there are tons of them. There are artists on spaces, there are projects, publishing, exhibitions, and it's also a choice where we look at it. So it's kind of this two-play scenario that's not out there, and there's, you know, mention of a couple of couples. It's a little bit strange for me, and frightening. <laughs> I don't know where you guys are, but it's, um, I'm also active with the Rise and Resist group. We have a lot of uh, HIV positive people in the group who are fighting together. And there, you know, there's a lot of things. I'm not saying that it's rosy, but it's not as such a doomsday as from, you know, I would get the impression. Thank you for that. Any other thoughts? Yes, I would just say, um, John, John, I like the idea of the timeline being like collapsing, inflated in the 1980s, and this kind of shift that happened in 83, 84 ish. Um, what do you think were the characteristics of that early 80s period that, that kind of shifted? And what was the main catalyst? Was it was it HIV AIDS, or do you think there was also sort of like a, this commercialization or this drive for? Yeah, that, I think that that's a that's a really good point, and I would really. I would almost start the period at around 1978. Um, but there, it, was, it was AIDS and it was drugs. I think it was money coming from downtown 
curatorial money, um, collector money. There was a push to make things wilder and more, you know, um, fantastic. There, so I think that there was some, there was that element. But I also feel like um, there was a real effort of 57th Street to push, um, to push downtown, to push into Soho, to reestablish Soho, um, which had been, which had become sort of old hat in some way. It was like the the rags of of the Abex period. Um, so they were going to reestablish Soho and go head to head with East Village, um, and that meant a concerted effort um, to downplay the East Village in criticism and in um, journalism. Um, and all of that coincided with um, with AIDS. So that's how it is in my head. I mean, you know, she's this young lady that talked back there about all these groups and communities and younger people that are doing something. I see some of that happening too because I'm very. Um, two friends of mine uh, run a space on the Lower East Side called, called the Petit Versailles. Yes, and Jack Waters. Jack Waters and Peter Kramer, who are dear <coughs> friends of mine going way back to the 80s. Mm -hmm. And they're very involved in this community thing and working with the <coughs> community. And I think that a lot, what's happening with a lot of these youngers, the 20-somethings particularly, is that they were born like, you know, in the mid-80s or the early 90s. Mm -hmm. There's so much that happened back then that they've been like, protected from, there was sort of like this silence, this cut, this fracture. I noticed it with AIDS, where the generations, or there was my generation was very involved in AIDS, and, and, and then things started to like split, and there wasn't as much intergenerational stuff that happens, that go from generations, I started noticing, I'd go to spaces, and everyone was within the same age group, that intergenerational thing wasn't happening, which is how you get the transfer of this sort of information. And they're learning a lot of stuff now that happened, and they're going, why don't, why do, why don't we know about this? Mm -hmm. Why has this been kept from us? Why is nobody talking about this? This is really terrific, and I think it invigorates them a lot. You know? And then the anger starts coming out, because they felt like it was kept from them intentionally, and this is what they need to sort of like be able to explore. They've been looking for some kind of way to express and release themselves creatively in a very free way from this very tight structured capitalist market that's created. And then they find out that they, they want to know how they can do that. And then they look back at what was happening in the 80s and they're saying, why can't we have that now? Well, you can't, you know, there's a lot of things that have changed. There's less, there's less public space. There's more and more stuff that's become private. The economy has become much more expensive. The graduate students are, are, are turning on all these students and have to be able to theorize and talk about their work in very intentional ways and have certain, and they have these, the art of doing business has moved into college. We didn't have any of that back then. We had to sort of figure it out. So there's a certain kind of freedom. And a lot of that freedom is lost. And I think, you know, the, um, a lot of the younger generation is feeling like they've been brought into this thing where this is the way you have to operate. And then they find out, well, there was a time where it didn't operate this way. And why that they lied to us? They're cheating us. So fuck them, and they get really angry, and they sort of go into it, and it's like wonderful to see that happening. But um, you know, they have to put up with a lot. So we're creating many Davids. Yeah, they're creating that. They're really drawn <laughs> to David's work. I mean, when when Gracie and I did a show of David's work after he died, when she was still on St. Mark's Place. It was close to NYU. There were all these droves of kids that were coming, and they had no idea that David Wanamaker was a visual artist. Mm -hmm. They thought of him as a writer, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and they said, "Oh, he's making this stuff too." I mean, maybe they'd seen the illustrations, but they figured there were maybe little things that he did to illustrate some of his work, but they didn't realize that he was a full-on visual artist. You know, and the whole thing with film. There's a very funny story I heard about David in film. Is, is that I think it was Richard Kern said. David wanted to get into films because he figured it would make him famous. And when he found out that wasn't happening, then he lost interest. <laughs> That's like part of the story. It's not entirely true, but I thought that was really funny. Had he lived longer, though, maybe he's a filmmaker by now. And that's, that's that, yeah. I'm thinking about the conversation that <laughs> well, we had in life. He films, but David worked across. I mean, he, he's he's an artist. He wanted to do things with music. He wanted to do things with film. He wanted to develop his writing. He wanted to make visual things. But I think. 
his his real strong thing was in the use of language that would go into mm -hmm. writing and how he could use that in films and creating these symbols that he could use to kind of move things forward. Yeah, I, oddly, I, I think his real strength, I agree, is across the disciplines and creating these resonant images or concepts, whether they're groups of, of words or still images or moving images. Mm -hmm. uh, I often think of that, um, it's Ralph Waldo Emerson who wrote that, that uh, essay in the, the early 1800s saying, America has yet to produce the great poet. Where is the great poet who speaks of our time, who creates his own words, who gives to everything its own name and not another's? And I think of David that way often. It's that ability to name um, and to sort of create, a, well, I mean, a, a meme, honestly, an idea captured into a, a cultural unit. I mean, I think that's what he did so well. You know, I'm thinking back that Louis Frangelo is also a part of this, right? And I kind of wonder, Louis was a very sweet, affectionate, open kind of person. And when I saw that documentary, that uh, little documentary, that film that um, Miriam Sakima made, and she talked about David, and one thing that he said was he always wanted to see images that spoke to him as a gay man, and how to put these images for front and center in his work, which is a very scary thing to do. Mm -hmm. And it took him a lot of time to be able to do that, and a lot of writing, he says, with all these homosexual things that sort of happened, he wrote about as though they were other people, like in his first things, the sounds, and he says, they weren't really other people, a lot of them were me, but I was too afraid to sort of do that. And I sort of wonder, because it's the 80s, it started loosening up, he got very angry, Luis was around, and I wonder, you know, I've always wondered how much, if I think of all the people that were around him, and David had a number of gay friends, uh, but I wonder that kind of sensitivity to feeling really comfortable and cozy with yourself in a very sensual way might have been sparked a little bit by Luis. He seems like a likely character to, like if I see the timeline of when that eroticism started to come out, because hmm. um, it wasn't there earlier. It didn't really start coming out until the show of PPOWs. So that was like after 88. It must have been like 89, 90, when we did that show with the flowers that looked very pretty. Right. And then you read right. the stories, and it's all about these lore and sex things that he's going in, being stalked by men, and it gets very visual about ejaculation and everything like that. That's. Yes. Um, with like, I mean, this isn't um, as much Luis, but with David, he's gaining like a lot of like commercial success right now. He's just been, he has a big retrospective that has just been held in an institution. And as people have kind of, um, I don't know, to some degree firsthand, some will say like, um, with like knowing this person, is there any kind of frustration, but like, I don't know, like putting aside the positivity, like is there any kind of frustration that um, like arises from watching this kind of success and this like romanticization of him? And... Mm. I don't know, I guess my thing always is, is not bringing him part back into the community. There's a whole, um, I mean, you know, they, 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 you think about his collaborations with this show is really interesting with Louis Franchella. I mean, you, you, you could do a numerous shows because David loved to collaborate. That was like a really big thing with him. And there's this whole list of people that he collaborated with. There was that Simeo textbook, right? That was like David and his friends. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then they were all talking about all these projects with David. And David was a very one-on-one -on -one person. He wouldn't hang out in groups or hang out in clubs. He was always like a one-on-one -on -one person. And he had this relationship with everyone. Everyone thought I was the most important person in his life. And David was really intimate with me. Then you find out that there are 12 other people that have the same story, right? <laughs> but in reading that book, you get this kind of multifaceted thing about David, and one thing that I re recognized through reading that is how mean he could be. He could be really mean. I was like really shocked. I never saw that side of him. But, um, you know, there's a lot of other interesting things that came out too, but it's, it's a very, especially what Miriam had to say and, and, and Tom Ruffenbart had to say in that book. Um, 
But yeah, I guess it's the frustrating thing about the community, and, and I guess this other thing that really frustrates me even more than that is this whole thing that everything that David has done has been collapsed into some sort of AIDS messaging mm -hmm. or his annual being AIDS, especially with that film that he made in Mexico. Mm -hmm. I mean, I represent, Grace and I were representing him when he did that period. I remember the show that happened, I remember him going to Mexico, I remember him writing all these checks and sending it to Mexico. AIDS was not anything to do with anything in his thinking at that time. It was about property, the capitalism, you know, the, 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 the church, all that kind of stuff. And then it all later became used as, when they did that hide and, that hide and Hide and seek. I seek. Yeah. I see. It was all of a sudden all about AIDS, and everything we did was about AIDS. And I'm saying, well, there was a point that was like before that, where he wasn't really thinking about that. And the same way, but all this other stuff. But hide and seek. The the big thing was that it was a desecration of of, of Jesus by having the hands mm -hmm. crawl over the crucifix. Right. So mm -hmm. was, I mean, what am I remembering that wrong? No, no, but they were taking the whole idea of the film and the ideas in the film were metaphors for the suffering, someone suffering with AIDS. I mean, you could do that with anything. You could take a bunch of dead flowers and yeah. say, this is about the, you know, which is what they did with the uh, AIDS Art America show. You know, I mean, everything became a metaphor for AIDS and you could do that with everything. This floor, look at the floor and how it's being worn and you can feel the worn and the tearing of the body down. You know, mm -hmm. it gets ridiculous after a while. Um, and in Hide Seek, they actually, uh, it was Jonathan Katz and, and Bart Everett actually took a tape from the Warnerovich archive that he had made at an AIDS protest, which was never intended to go with a fire in my belly, the footage that we and know And they used it as the audio. And they used it as the audio. So I would say that's a really, um, that, that, that's more than just sort of suggesting that this has a, a take on AIDS or that this might be about it. This is, that is forcing a meaning onto something which may or may not be there from what we can read from anything right. David ever wrote. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Hugh, that's right up, right up the alley to the wall labels and museum shows that say, well, in this work we can see the artist feeling X, Y, Z, and this is a young curator talking about somebody who's been dead before they were ever born, and they have no idea what that artist was thinking, but they don't, they don't hesitate to make that up, you know. Oh yeah, I spend most of my time in museums arguing with the wall text. <laughs> That's basically what I do. Uh, I really like the Brooklyn Museum because they have an app now where you can like message with the curatorial team directly, and I will, I'll just talk, I'll be like, why did you use that word in the, the wall text? Why, why? What does that mean? What does this, what does this sentence mean? Um, I, I think it's good to push museums and galleries on their wall texts. Um, going back to your, your question about frustrations, I will say that I think my, my one frustration about this moment is the one that I have sort of in the art world in general. It's like this question of what is equitable and what is fair. I think David should of course be in the, the Whitney, you know, and should have this retrospective and should be part of that higher echelon art world, you know, uh, white glove, white shoe. At the same time, I think that system is entirely unfair and ushering him into it is uh, in some ways a betrayal of, of what he stood for, and yet it's the system that we have. So it's sort of like, I, I want to argue for both fairness and equality, right? That he should get to be as recognized as everyone else should, but also the system is terrible and we should tear it down, right? So it's like a little bit hard to hold both of these things at the same time, but I think we need to. I think I would follow up on it by saying it's not just systemic, but a form of cultural laziness, that we prefer to think of some people as being elevated well above the others. In fact, um, genius to the human ge genome is relatively common. Uh, we're not that distinct in that way. Um, but it's a way to dismiss most people, mm -hmm. most art. It's a way to reduce the scale of the world, to redu reduce the scale of influencing intelligence, right? Outside, um, outside exertion on your on your mindset, right? So, it's not just David. It's you know it's something that we do just over and over again, um, and it's definitely something you could be critical of in the Whitney's, in the in the Whitney's curation, but it's the Whitney, right? They're always they always do it. Yeah. I just, um, even the Whitney's wonderful um, 
presentation of David's work in the fact that, well, I went, I went to maybe to the show like four or five times, and to me, the room I was most drawn to was the room with the um, images of the other artists and at collaboration with the pier. And it took me the last visit there to see that they actually had included the names of the other artists in very small print to the far left of the screen, whereas I had conversations with people for the last end of the summer, whenever I talked about the show, how disappointed I was that those artists weren't identified. So, you know, you choose David apart from the many other artists who were his friends and collaborators that made David possible, mm -hmm. in, in, in my estimation. And the moment in time, in my experience of the shift of propelling David as the star of the period was the Witness Against Our Vanishing exhibition when, you know, rightfully so, there was an outcry of his essay being um, defunded. So, having lived in New York among these people since 1980, you know, being in this room where there's, you know, the collaboration of David and Luis in equal measure is much more rewarding to me than the experience of seeing David singled out at the Whitney as a spokesman of the period of time of AIDS and AIDS activism. Mm -hmm. And one has to look to things like the Visual AIDS Archive, which is much more egalitarian, or the Fales Library, and do research, or you know, thinkers like yourselves, to see that it's a much broader experience than just David's voice. And then the other nuances of the AIDS experience, including poetry and spirituality and softer voices amongst this sort of cry and force of nature that David had. Like it's, it's almost in a way that there's a half a dozen people that I could think of, and it's not that David wouldn't have existed, he would have created something that wouldn't have been as, would have been as large and as huge had he had not, if you pull up uh, Louis Franchella and Kiki Smith and maybe uh, Miriam Sakima and Peter Bouchard. You know, David still would have created his art, but I don't think it would, would have been as big with all the people who were driving him. Because people recognized, I mean, the community recognized that David really had something special, right? You can sort of see that when you're an artist. We also saw that with Basquiat. And I think it, the people that are really creative and artists are drawn to that, and they also feed it, because they think all this stuff, and the artist picks up on this feeding and it pushes them into bigger things and throwing ideas like, you know, these supermarket posters. It's not like David said, hey, well, let me get a supermarket poster thing. I mean, Keith Davis was scrounging around the street, found all these supermarkets, had a silk screen studio in his loft where David had a lot of work. And he says, oh, David, here, here are these supermarket posters. We should do something with them. Now, he didn't tell him to the baby. You know, that's all of David. But that whole, that, that whole thing, series came into being through this thing with someone putting the same thing with the driftwood. You know what I mean? It's like David didn't just go say, well, let me go and paint this driftwood. It was like Elaine King and Keith took him to the beach for a thing, and Keith bought all his art supplies and said, oh, David, let's go and like, paint this driftwood. And they were up there at the beach, and that's what they did, and it became like a real thing. You know, so it's not, not to take away from David's... Um, talent, ability, and resourcefulness with doing, doing things like this, but a lot of it was pushed by creative people that gravitated towards him, and then he pulled in all that energy and spit it out again, and that's who got the results. That's this whole thing of like feeling like if he was on an island by himself, what might, what might we have seen? I don't think you know, we get quite as many of the places that he might have gone. Even like me, Louis Franchella to take him to Argentina, you know what I mean? That thing with Argentina was really huge. When David came back with that work, we were like, like, wow, those huge paper pieces? None oh, of them were in the Whitney. Amazing. In the Whitney show. I mean, those were incredible. What you're, what you're saying, I think, leads us into talking a little bit about the pier. Um, when, at its, at its inception, became such a wonderful place where artists could look at each other's work and maybe 
paint over it, paint under it, paint around it, paint with it. Yeah. I think that very much appealed to David and Louise. Yeah. <clears throat> because Louise was always, when we did the show in 83, the walls of this gallery, floor to ceiling, 14 feet high, were painted, and then paintings put on top of them. Mm -hmm. But at the pier, you know, it was just anything goes. And I think that collaboration between all the artists was was so successful. And meeting other artists. I mean, a lot of artists yeah. met there for the first time. Exactly, yeah. And they didn't only meet them just as people, they met them actually working and were charged by their work. And there was so much space in that. You know, you could just take a huge space and work out huge space after huge space to be able to use. Um, no, it was, it was really important to sort of like bringing the community together and then you'd go there the next day and something would happen, you wouldn't know who had created it and then someone would creep in and you'd meet them. And so earlier we were talking about the difference between then and now. <clears throat> Where is a space like the pier? How could something like that happen? You know, that is, is there anything in New York that would remotely offer that kind of opportunity? Yeah, yeah because everything's know. become private space. Yeah, you don't exactly. have these abandoned buildings everywhere and these lots that you could go in and shoot some kind of crazy film in. When did they cover up Five Points? Was that, what, five years ago? Where they covered all the graffiti over in Five Points? Like, that's the last big public space that I can think of where yeah. I knew people working. It's, it's very, very hard to have that, and like I've had it friends on the street, you know, we used to be able to go on the street in Avenue A and just with the camera create some kind of a scene and shoot it, and people would just walk around and you would not care. Now a cop will stop you and say, you have a license, you don't have a license to shoot you, you have to stop. It's like, I'm just here making what, some silly little film. But even the, even the club scene, I mean, Limbo Lounge, Mud Club, all those places, you know, David and Louise, Keith Haring, they would go and create stage sets overnight, for, yeah. and, and the, you know the, it was it was kind of almost a kind of prelude to the pier, the, the freedom they had. I don't think that existed. Well, there are some things walls that, in Brooklyn that do things. You know, Beezy Barefoot has this loft and has created things, and there's a mixed festival that happens every year. There's a big crazy collaborative thing that goes well, on for like a few weeks, but. Yeah, and there's a really exciting drag scene in Brooklyn right now. I mean, when I think about what's exciting in nightlife, uh, I, I definitely think about the drag scene in Brooklyn. And it, it's not the same level of stage sets, except maybe like a place like House of Yes, which is mostly more of a straight venue. But you definitely see these performers who are taking on identities. I think that they're coming a little bit more out of the YouTube world of drag than the sort of like club world of drag. But it's sort of interesting to see how that's being realized in physical space. Um, I think one of the other lockdowns on... Um on those kinds of big spaces is that the, the arts, literature and the arts, um, the entry the entry point now, you have to have that academic cre credibility. And, it's, and that is a way that we have managed to close off um, a variety of voices. We, we can have an apparency of, um, of variance, right? But still, everybody has been normalized. Mm -hmm. um, so that's very much a part, I think, of the current ethos of what gets accepted and, and canonized in that way. Big time. I've always said, if Basquiat were doing what he was doing back then today, he would never get the kind of recognition. Absolutely no way. Because of that, you know, he didn't have the right credentials, and no matter how crazy the kid is, it's just kind of snuffed down. You know, he didn't go to Skowhegan, he didn't do his thing at Yale, that's so like, who cares? Tom? Yeah, I would have to agree with her and say that, you know, in Gowanus or Bushwick, there's, they have art events where over 600 artists participate. Um, you can walk through a lot of Gowanus and every building is covered with all different kinds of gorgeous murals. and. It's not going to get recognized by 57th Street or the super wealthy people, but you know it's being sponsored by small businesses and all sorts of groups. And an artist pitch in for rents, like guys like Solway. It's a run by you know artists and. Uh, but and there's 30 of them like that in Guam, exactly. exactly. you know, and right. and they're doing stage sets for the clubs. And you go into some of these clubs, and there's artwork. A lot, mostly it's from Brooklyn people, but there's artwork from artists from Holland and 
Switzerland and, and Nigeria too. And um, I know so many people that are co collaborating on books and magazines and comics and posters and archives and, and um, I mean, maybe it's not the kind of art you, you, would, you would recognize or, or, or respect, but um, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of artists in Brooklyn doing a lot of stuff, and, you know, some in Staten Island and the Bronx too, but I mean, Long Island City, I don't know so much about it, but um, I don't know, there's a lot going on in Brooklyn. Well, that's encouraging to hear. <laughs> that's certainly Absolutely. encouraging to hear. Absolutely. But what is the end point of these artists? If they're happy working inside our community, like we were back then, and it's not so much focused on getting the... I mean, you're talking about doing stuff in buildings. I mean, you can do stuff in buildings without any kind of permission or authorization. It seems that now that well, now they're, they're interested in, in, in supporting it because it creates part of the environment for real estate interests, so it sounds like to me, when businesses are doing it. It yeah, makes it look more arty, yeah. so more arty people will want to live here, rather than something that's being built for the artists to do their exchange. Oh yes, I got this thing, well, I have this business now, they'll let me do this wall thing. So it's still tied in with like commerce and business, rather than just taking something over and doing it. You know, the idea of an artist community collective and artists getting together and sharing rent and doing shows and stuff for themselves, that's been going that's on throughout. That's never changed, right? right? Okay. But what comes out of it and the reasons for doing it or wanting to do it, I think it's shifted a little bit. Mm -hmm. There's more. Well, yeah, you have 600 artists. They're going to have 600 different opinions, and the artists in 2018 are not going to be the same as the artists in 1978. Right. So yeah, it shifted a lot. And absolutely, absolutely. But what's the end point? Are, are they making this to create a community, or are they making it because they eventually want to hit it big? I mean, I guess we always want to hit it big too, but we weren't. That wasn't the both. end goal. But I, absolutely I think both. we're not the about hitting it big. I mean, I mean, Hal sells my artwork, but most, mostly my art is part of a community, and um, nobody here would ever see it, but there's blocks in Brooklyn where Every house, every apartment has my artwork in it. Um, and I know artists from Harlem and East Harlem that the whole neighborhood loves these people, you know, and... Um, oh, the appreciation yeah, for yeah. artists from the community, that's wonderful. <laughs> when people outside of being artists start to love the idea that they're artists in the community, that's wonderful. Well, on that note, folks, thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you. <laughs>